hour has 22 minutes. Hello, Canada, and welcome to This Hour Has 22 Minutes New Year's Eve special. We're going to be taking a look at some of the more interesting stories that we've brought you this past season. The highs, the lows, the, the, the middles. The agony, the ecstasy, the... Hank, roll our year in review. Well, Frank, it's not really a year in review. It's more like three months in review. Well, a year, three months, what's the difference? Nine months, I guess. I stand correct. <laughs> Hank? In the month of October, Statistics Canada reported 30,000 jobs vanished in this country. In the month of October, the man they call Ravine toured extensively throughout this country. Are these two seemingly unrelated facts linked in some way? We thought so. When contacted, Ravine, the impossibilist, had this to say about that. It was caused by the natural law party. In a good way, Doug Henning was bouncing up and down in a yogic fervor. He bounced too high, hit his head on the ceiling, fell to the floor, forgot his mantra, and jumped up and screamed, Que pasa? Que pasa? Which is Spanish. And all the jobs instantly went to Mexico. As the great impossibilist, can you personally do anything to help kickstart Canada's listless economy? I could help to keep all the money in the country. I will give my great test where I have the people lock their hands together right across Canada. And they will not be able to spend it, and they'll have tremendous wealth. Gee. You know, I still can't seem to get my hands apart. <laughs> Pierre Elliott Trudeau was at the National Archives last week where he launched his new book, Memoirs. He also donated his public and private papers, said to be over one kilometer long. He electrified the crowd with vintage Trudeau. Herodotus uh, was uh, more advanced than Homer, who, whose history was largely made of myths. But Thucydides was more advanced and a little more scientific than Herodotus. And Trudeau went on to say that Thucydides had his faults as well. And he wasn't trying to knock Homer, but let's face it, Homer was no Herodotus. I must say, it's nice to have a politician back who speaks the language of the people. Sydney. In Toronto, a former court reporter claims that an Ontario judge rubbed up against her at an office party and said, that's not a roll of quarters you're feeling their baby. <laughs> this raises a lot of troubling questions. Come clean, judge. If it wasn't a roll of quarters, what was it then? A roll of loonies? <laughs> or maybe a roll of lifesavers? And another thing, if it was a roll of quarters, was it a full roll or a half roll? <laughs> And if it was a half roll, what happened to the other half? <laughs> and what does this say about the justice system in this country when a man with only half a roll in his pants can go around deciding other people's fate? Thank you, Sydney. The Kim Campbell campaign was struck by disaster today. It is now apparent that rumors of the Prime Minister's breakdown are true. The first signs programs. of a mental collapse the appeared Liberals, last week the hand, when the Prime Minister, with her bare teeth, chewed holes in a Liberal document. <laughs> Today, the crisis deepened. Campaign aides on the Kim Campbell camper bus found the Prime Minister huddled in the rear, babbling like an idiot and banging her head against the toilet. Let's keep the front clear. Yes, Aides jammed a hockey helmet on her head and rushed her to a shock treatment facility. Damage control minister Ross Reed is at a complete and total loss. This just in. Apparently, former fisheries minister John Crosby visited Kim Campbell on her bus this morning, and in jest, the former fisheries minister exposed himself and triggered the nervous breakdown. <laughs> to Ottawa now, where John Crosby spoke to reporters only moments ago. She can't take a joke. You, people, you can't take a joke either. There's not one damn one of you can take a joke. We are now joined by Prime Minister Kim Campbell. <laughs> Prime Minister, all reports say your campaign is spinning out of control, that you're on the way to becoming one of Canada's 1.6 million unemployed. Is this true? <laughs> Prime Minister, have you lost your mind? Prime Minister, 
Can you hear me? Can, can she hear me? Yes? Prime Minister. Hey! Hey! Mrs. Well, there you have it. Uh, Prime Minister Kim Campbell denying, I suppose, that she has lost her mind. Mr. Manning, now that the election is over, will you appear on this hour has 22 minutes? Under no circumstances will I appear on this hour has 22 minutes. You know who I am? I'm J.B. Dixon. I have heard of J.B. Dixon. I understand that he is a lousy journalist. That's it. Forty laid-off workers in the town of Conception Bay, South Newfoundland, are upset by a new Employment Canada policy. If someone receiving benefits does not answer the phone when called for work, their benefits are cut off. These workers are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are now joined by Mrs. Marie Morrissey. Yes, yeah, so I went out to the freaking drive-in mess! We are also joined by the community's unemployment claims officer, Mr. Gerard Morrissey. Now, Mrs. Morrissey, moving to you, you've been taken off unemployment insurance. Why is this? Look, I stepped out there freaking store for five freaking minutes for a bottle of drink. You weren't gone for one minute. You were gone for two hours. I know, because I called. All right! I stopped and I had a tan Daphne's and I had a puff bar and a cola light. Daphne, what do you drink cola light for? It's still cold. A little size of you. Do you think it's fair that a person's unemployment benefits would be cut off just because they did not answer a telephone call? Fair? Look, I'm not talking about fair. I work for Unemployment Canada. I got a job to do. I got a job. Obviously, that's why she resents me. Yeah, you got a job, you low-life, bottom-feeding, scumbag claims investigator! You're biting the hand that feeds you. Oh, my son, these are the hands that feed me. I'm not afraid to work. Look at these hands. Politics! Politics! Mrs. Morrissey, do you feel now like you're under house arrest? Yes. What's that? <laughs> Look, how hard is it to sit down by the phone and wait for it to ring? I mean, if you can't do that, you should be cut off. Cut off? Cut off? Listen here, JB. That's my freaking suck old stool pigeon husband over there, and that don't know the meaning of cut off. Check in with me tonight, my son, and we'll see who's cut off. <laughs> Okay, now, Mr. Morrissey, if you do succeed in getting all of these 40 workers cut off, what will become of them? Well, there's work out there, JB, if people want it. Oh, and I see. And what kind of work would that be, Mr. Morrissey? I don't know. Work. <laughs> Going around doing stuff. Putting up fences. Taking down fences. I mean, I'm just trying to get these people up off the couch, on their feet, show them some initiative, and give them back their self-esteem. Thank you very much to the both of you. Thank you. When are you coming home? <laughs> I'll be home in a while. What do you want now? Come home for your pork chops, will you? I'll bring home a bar. Loves ya. And now, as a public service, we go to no-name candidate Merg Delahunty with her address to the nation. Merg? Hi, I'm Mark Delahunty, and I'm running in the federal election as a candidate at large. Now, I suppose you're wondering what in the hell I'm doing running an election, lying here, cagged off like an oriental potentate. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I think that's too important an issue to be discussed during a federal election campaign. And like the PM, I'm only willing to discuss deficit reduction and fiscal restraints. Fiscal restraints. Well, Jesus, we're restrained, all right. We're hog-tied, handcuffed, slip-knotted, and gagged to within an inch of our fiscal lives. It's like we're being caught up in some kind of monetary sadomasochism, a kind of economic S&M, where if the fiscal <laughs> policies of the conservative government don't hurt, if they don't hurt real bad, then Kimmy and the boys can't get off. Well, you know what they say. It takes two to S&M. And we can tell them we don't want to play. We can take off the dog collar, throw away the leash, tell Kimmy and her boys to put down the knout and the bastinado, because we don't want to play. Oh, I've been a bad country, and I need to be punished. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> anymore. So if you're sick of the bondage and discipline policies of the conservative government, well, mark an X for change. Mark an X for me, Valerie Pringle. Oh, I just 
just kidding. I didn't want the youngsters to see me on TV talking about SEX. <laughs> what the hell? Sure, the youngsters wouldn't be caught dead watching the CBC. So vote for me, Anne Medina. <laughs> Sorry, Anne. It's me, Marg Dillahunty, and I'm looking for your vote on the 25th of October. And for those of you who may not think tonight's telecast is heady enough, tonight we crack the back of James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> River run past Eve and Adams, from swerve of shore to bend of bay. Well, I think that'll just about do. <laughs> Next week, paragraph two. The wife of fugitive warlord Muhammad Farah Adid has turned up in, of all places, London, Ontario. The woman, known only as Debbie Adid, is now living with her children in a subsidized apartment and receiving welfare. She joins us now. <laughs> Miss Adid, how are you today? Fine. Now, how did you come to be the wife of such a notoriously violent man? Well, I met him at Sparkles and I said, what do you do? <laughs> He said, I'm a warlord. And I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm a warlord. And, you know, I thought, wow, a warlord. And, and what first attracted me to him was, well, he's a warlord. <laughs> and he looked like Dustin Hoffman, only shorter. So, so uh, obviously now you are very close to Mr. Adid. You're the one to tell us what makes him tick. You mean, why is he a warlord? Yes. Well, I thought about this, and I think it's because he's a warlord, because he's really sensitive and he's easily hurt, so it's sort of a protection device. But the United Nations considers Mr. Adid a menace who must be stopped. Now, what do you have to say to that? Oh, well, the United Nations don't know him like I do. <laughs> He's actually funny. <laughs> he kills me, and not just me. <laughs> A lot of people say he slays them. <laughs> but, Miss Adid, you're on welfare. You have nothing. If Mr. Adid has money for armies and weapons, why not money for his family? Why has he abandoned you? No, 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 no. I says to him, don't bother visiting. Stay in Mogadishu. <laughs> Because every time he visits, even for the weekend, they knock my doll. It's wicked. <laughs> but he is sweet, you know? Like, sure, he lies and kills and maims and steals, but he don't drink. <laughs> I'm standing here quite close to Mr. Conrad Black, who's going around the country flogging his new book, A Life in Progress. Now, let's face it. Mr. Black has bucks. He has big bucks. He has bucks beyond the computing capacity of most pocket calculators. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't impressed by that. But I'm a reporter, and I'm going to approach Mr. Black with a certain amount of professionalism. I will not grovel or fawn or otherwise embarrass myself. Money, prestige, and power mean nothing to me. I have integrity. It's God over mammon with me all the way. I am not one of those pathetic, soulless people who believe that money is the alpha and omega of our very existence. Uh, Mr. Black, I'm a reporter with uh, This Hour Has 22 Minutes. Oh, golly. You've got a lot of money you, you, and... You don't uh, have to be in the knees. Uh, I was just... Well, of course. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not accustomed with, to this uh, much submission from the press. Of course, of course. Uh, it's just you have so much money and... I mean, could you... Give me some, or, like, give me a couple of shares in a, in a, well, a paper route, or, or, you know, just the two. Every time I turn around, some baby boomer is going on and on and on about Generation X. Now, baby boomers, they love being baby boomers, but they can't handle the fact that my generation, our generation, don't have any names attached to it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that we don't want to hear those endless stories about where you all were when JFK was shot, how you were sitting in your classroom, principal came in, made the announcement, teacher cried, all that, and we're really sorry y'all had to live through the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we didn't live through that stuff. We looked it over in grade eight, but we didn't live through it. So we don't have any common denominators. There have been no defining moments of our generation. Okay, we, we all know where we were when River Phoenix died, but that was two weeks ago and hardly counts. 
So the next time you turn on the TV, you see some baby boomer going on and on and on about Generation X, don't believe them, it's all lies. Baby boomers probably should be in bed. <laughs> As the old nursery rhyme goes, the grand old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. But does he? <laughs> Prince Andrew, Duke of York, visited Canada recently, and his men are the focus of this week's special report by this hour's investigative unit, that would be me, which filed this exclusive story. The royal family has always jealously guarded its secrets, but these days, that's getting harder and harder to do. This hour has 22 minutes, has learned exclusively that the grand old Duke of York does not in fact have 10,000 men. MI5 has asked us not to reveal exactly how many. It could be more, it could be less. We do know he has some men. There are men here. Men named Oliver. Men named Tristan. Men named Moria. Also present today, a Prince Andrew lookalike whose job it is to draw sniper fire away from the prince. Royal watchers were out as well. Some in royal red, keen to photograph the much-touted 10,000 men. But they were disappointed. The prince himself seemed oblivious to the presence of our camera, until we put to him the kind of hard-hitting question that this hour has 22 minutes is famous for a program which asks the kind of questions that need to be asked. Your Highness, who do you like in the World Cup? <laughs> amazing question. Frank. That was a great question, Frank. Thank you. When you've been in the business as long as I have, you go with your hunches. I doubt that the constitutional politicians uh, in Northern Ireland have any authority over these murdering butchers. The IRA butchers? The bloody butchery in Somalia? The butcher of Leon? Yeah, I'm a butcher. Hey, I got feelings too. I'm in here all day, covered in blood, humping around cow carcasses, so you can have your Canada number one grade A crown roast, your top quality pork chops fed on. But then, oh, when somebody can't think of something bad enough to call someone who's committed an unspeakable act, what did he call him? A butcher. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your appreciation. A professor of mathematics in New Brunswick says that if a girl gets asked to a guy's room, she ought to consider that an invitation to go all the way. Huh, he can't mean that. He's just kidding. He must be fooling around. Well, golly. In that case, maybe an invite to the library means you're gonna get a pencil stuck in your ear. Maybe Merry Christmas means feel your breast miss. I don't buy any of this stuff for a minute. On top of that, this guy says that a gal oughtn't to say anything if she gets raped in a guy's room. Only to ask for money. Kind of like a prostitute, I guess. See, this guy figures if you ever had sex before, getting raped oughtn't to be a problem. He says it's like a date. He calls it date rape. Ha! Huh, he must be goofing around. And this crazy doofus does the job on boys and men, too. Saying they're so out of control and horny, they can't help themselves. Well, that's a low-down, disgusting thing to say about one of my favorite sexes, the male sex. <laughs> you know, I figure this professor's more like a Jerry Lewis type, like a nutty professor. Sometimes men can be so wise, and I think we overlook just how brilliant they are. And on the other hand, how far too few of them are having their balls ripped off by Dobermans. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just goofing around. I love men. They're great. We're going to take a little look in the House of Commons now. Don't freak out. It's just good graphic. Come on. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Oh. There we go. Looking now at the House of Commons, we see that the climate has changed 
drastically since the last time we looked. Of course, that's because the Tories used to have 154 seats. Now they have two. That's a difference of, let's see, 154 minus two. Two from four is two. Bring down the five, likewise. One, 152 seats they lost. Now, of course, word is they spent upwards of $10 million on this campaign. Let's work that out for two seats. Two into 10 million, that's two into 10 is five. Carry the zero, carry the zero, carry the zero, 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 zero. Five million dollars a seat. Let's just look at the map here now. We see that right here, let's see this. I don't know if you can see it at home. It's like a little tiny blue kind of maybe a piece of spittle or something well it's not spittle it's the Tories and I've been in there and I tell you it's a real nice setup this year they got a, they got a little card table a little piano bench and they just tucked a couple of phone books in there so the two of them can sit up there and get their necks up and just see what's going on around them. very very cute that's it for the outlook in the House of Commons I'd say for the next four or five years well, that's the way we saw the world over the last three months. This is J.B. Dixon saying goodbye to the Chinese year of the chicken and hello to the year of the dog. And I think it was Gump Worsley who said it best when he said, Happy New Year. Well, only 10,800 seconds left until 1994. Let's start the countdown. 10,799. This year I'm not going to eat any fat or go out with any goalies. <laughs> Here, blow this. 10,798. Here's cheers. Cheers. 10,796. There's a race going on in Canada, and Jean Chrétien is giving it all he's got. This election is an election about choices. It's about who's in the best shape to lead. It's about stamina. It's about strength. It's about electing a leader who can handle the pace of the night. Who should represent Canada on the world stage? We say Jean Chrétien. On election day, we vote Liberal. A judge somewhere in Canada today apparently said something last week concerning a story we cannot reportedly report. We will not be able to report on this story until what is similar to a ban, but what is not a ban, is lifted. This has been the Censored News. <laughs>